I'm Dr. Stephanie Gazda, and I'm here at the University of Florida in a lab to learn all about ants today. And today, I have two experts on ants. I have Dr. Nick Kaiser. Hello. And Dr. Hua Yan. Hello. And we're going to learn all about ants. So why study ants? Hua. Uh, I'm a geneticist. So I'm interested in how genes and the biological pathways regulate social organization and their social behavior. And Nick, why do you study ants? Yeah, so I'm a behavioral ecologist, and I'm interested in how individuals' traits can influence the collective behaviors of animal societies and how those collective traits influence their uh, ecological interactions, especially with infectious diseases. Great. So you both study ants, but you study different aspects. Is that correct? Was that a good assumption? Yes, correct. So why, if you, if you work on two different things, what can you learn about from each other? Uh, so Nick started ant species, uh, acorn ant species. Uh, so he started on pathogen transmission and also his uh, technique for the video tracking system will help me to understand uh, ant communication. And Nick? Yeah, so I think it's really important. Collaboration is super important uh, f to do these sort of like um, cross-disciplinary studies. And you know, I, I study uh, sort of affects at different levels of biological organization, so individuals, colonies, but working with, with Hua, we can also get down to um, sensory system levels and even the uh, level of the gene. So we can really go from the level of the gene to the level of the society when we're working together. And is it often that you find collaboration like this in animal behavior? I think so, yeah. Yeah, it's very important for the current studies because different uh, scientists have different expertise, so we can combine our expertise to do the more like interdisciplinary studies. And do you study any other species besides ants? Uh, for me, I mainly focus on study ants, but also interested in honeybees and uh, social wasps. And Nick? Yeah, I study all sorts of things. So I study ants and wolf spiders and jumping spiders and social spiders and fruit flies. So I really feel like I'm question driven as opposed to studying specific uh, species. So we want to know what types of research questions can we address looking at this specific animal. And that's why this is an animal behavior issue and not necessarily like a species issue. Like we are interested in, we're question driven, correct? Yes. Exactly. Yes, Excellent. that's correct. Okay. So my question, what species are we going to be looking at today? Today we're going to be talking about uh, Temnothorax curvy spinosis. And the common name of that often, it's often referred to as the acorn ant. Okay, and Hua, you actually study another ant and you have an example right here? Yes. This is an ant specimen and uh, it's an Indian champion ant. Okay. And it's called Hapinesos saltator. And it's, uh, why is it called the jumping ant? Uh, because they can jump a few inches. <laughs> <laughs> All right. And Nick, why is it called the acorn ant? Well, as you can see uh, inside this chamber, they actually live inside preformed cavities, which is oftentimes in deciduous forests inside hollowed out acorns. Um, yeah, so the entire colony is inside the acorn, and we can bring it into the lab, study it here. And this ant, so the Indian jumping ant we're talking about is way bigger than those little guys, right? Yes, the Indian jumping ant is about 1.5 centimeters, that's the normal size. And then those that's are... That's huge, that's like the size of an entire colony. Excellent, <laughs> all right, great. And so why would you study these species of ants? Uh, I mainly study this ant because of how easy it is to collect. Uh, so you can go out into the forest, collect acorns, and you bring back the entire colony um, in, and it's inside the lab, so they have uh, relatively small colony sizes, which makes it a little bit easier to manipulate for experiments. And Hua, why do you study? Yeah, I started this in Indian champion is uh, because uh, we can do the genetic manipulation in this ant species. Uh, so the any workers can become uh, uh, reproductive, and we can use them to transmit the mutation we generate. And why ants? Like, so what is the purpose of having studies on ants? I think um, it's a really interesting animal to study when you're interested in, in eusocial uh, organization. So it's a really highly organized level of animal society. So tell me more about eusociality. Sure. So eusociality is the highest level of, uh, of organization in an animal society. And eusocial societies have three main characteristics. So we find that they have overlapping generations. So you'll have individuals of different ages within the same colony. You off, off, you'll also have a cooperative brood care, so individuals are taking care of the offspring that are not their own, so often they're siblings. 
and you also have reproductive division of labor, which means that some individuals in the colony, or sometimes only one individual, can actually produce offspring, and the rest are basically sterile and don't produce any uh, offspring. Adding to what Nick said, and also has a fascinating part to have this eusociality. So the ant colony can act as a superorganism. To achieve this, embryos in the social insects, basically they de develop into the different cars with phenotypic differences. So phenotype is what we see, correct? Yes, but they are gen genetically very similar. Are they clones? Uh, they are very like uh, nearly genetically identical, but uh, uh, although they are genetically identical, they display striking differences in their morphology, okay. uh, reproduction, uh, behavior, and the longevity. Strikingly, the queen basically only lay eggs, and they're larger than workers, and they have like ten t up to ten times longer life than the workers. So this is a very striking phenotypic differences. To achieve this, basically, there is a, a genetic and epigenetic mechanisms underlying this phenotypic difference. And so you said epigenetics. What does epigenetics mean? So basically, epigenetics is a study of heritable genetic changes that do not involve alteration of DNA sequences. And epigenetic regulation may result from a normal developmental uh, program or the external environment. Can you explain epigenetics? Like, can you draw that on the board for us? Uh, yes. So I draw on the board. OK, these are different cell types. And uh, this, uh, for example, this is, uh, these are the uh, skin cells, muscle cells, and uh, neurons. And uh, different cell types display different morphology, as shown here, and also different functions. But they all derive from uh, the same genetically identical embryonic stem cells. So these are embryonic stem cells. And they're all identical to each other. They are genetically identical to each other. Okay. And the epigenetic regulation is involved in this process of development. And they regulate certain genes on and off, and also alter their gene expression and maintain their gene expression, and thereby giving rise to different cell types. And so when you're studying ants, what are you looking at specifically for epigenetics? So as I said, ants basically start from the embryos. So these are ant embryos. and. Uh, they give rise to, instead of giving rise to cell types at the cellular level, they give rise to different cars, the queen versus workers okay. at the organism level. So epigenetic regulation is uh, likely being involved in this uh, differentiation. And we are interested and we're starting how epigenetic regulation regulates different uh, uh, phenotype, phenotypes in different castes. So they are identical animals, uh, but they have different genes that get th the genes, even though they're identical, some of them are switched on in some animals and not in others. And that's what you're looking at. Yes. And uh, this uh, different switch on and off basically give rise to the different castes with striking differences in their phenotypes. Great. Excellent. OK, so we're in your microscope room now. Yes. And we've been talking about ants. And they're in an acorn, right? Is that what Correct. we're looking at? Yes, that's right. So this is an acorn that we collected um, from the field. So this was in northeastern Ohio. And uh, so they start, they're living in an acorn in the, in the field. And what we want to do is move them into an artificial nest so we can watch their behavior in the lab. So you can actually see them. This is acorn that's sort of partially been opened. You can see them moving around inside uh, the inside of the acorn already. So because their home has basically been destroyed, the, some of the workers, these are the worker ants, you can see them will start picking up their brood and moving them because they need to find a new nest site. And we basically use that behavior 
um, to get them to move into an artificial nest so we can actually watch their behavior in the lab. Okay, so before you do it, what do you do? You just crack open the acorn and then That's let right. them run? That's right. Yep, so we crack open an acorn, we give them a new nest to move into, and uh, we just keep destroying their old nest to basically convince them, like, you can't live there anymore, you have to move into this new site. And what does the new nest look like? Yeah, so it's basically just a piece of uh, plastic that's been cut out, and we, we place it between two uh, microscope slides. So there's an empty uh, there's an empty nest that they can move into, and it has a lot of the characteristics that they really like, like having a really narrow entranceway. Um, and then what we'll do is we'll put this little red filter on top of the nest because ants can't see into the red spectrum of light. Mm -hmm. So to them, it's dark inside, but we can actually look through the red filter and watch their behavior without them knowing. Excellent. So can we crack an, ant, an acorn open and see what happens? Absolutely. Okay, so you have a new nest for them Correct. to go into. Correct. Yeah, this is the new nest site that they can move into. So it has a big uh, wide opening where they can keep all the larvae and all the workers okay. will live inside and the queen and then a, a narrow nest entrance. Entrance, um, which is something that this species really likes. So, and we have the red filter, so we put that on top. So, to them, it's a nice new dark uh, colony or a, col a nest site that they can move into since we destroyed their old nest. All right, and now you're going to crack. Yeah. The... So we give them the new nest, and then we just destroy the old site. And we should—they're just going to start running out. Yeah, they will not be happy about that. So you can see all of okay. the workers start sort of freaking out and grabbing all of the larvae, their sisters. Um, and then they're going to try to find a new suitable nest site. There goes the queen. Um, and they'll eventually, uh, what will happen is some of the workers will move in, uh, sort of go investigate the new nest. Mm -hmm. um, and they'll go back to their, uh, to their siblings and, and give them cues to say, I've found a new nest site. We should all move over there. Uh, and then once they basically reach a quorum, all of the colony will move into the new nest site and they'll all be living inside there. There. So this is something that people actually study in this species is nest site selection. Like what are the characteristics that, um, that the colony prefers to move into a new nest and how do workers convince other workers to, to move in there. And you said they do this by quorum, so that means that they need to have a majority that decide? Exactly. So it's kind of yes. like a democracy. It is. It's sort of a democratic process. <laughs> Does the queen have more say? Does she have more votes? Or? The queen has very basically no say. The workers, okay. the workers do almost this entire process, and the way that they usually move the queen in is one of the workers will just pick her up and carry her. <laughs> yeah. She, but she's bigger than them, right? Yeah. Well, ants are super strong. They can pick up all sorts of uh, of, of oh, larger objects. Okay. Yeah. Yes, yeah, so you can see they'll start moving the um, the larvae, which are hidden under here. Mm -hmm. They'll start moving them over to the new nest site, and it can sometimes take overnight or even longer. Um, to, to complete this task. And what really is fun is if you give them multiple nests and then the workers have to compete with one another to convince the other workers which is the better nest site. Wow, I feel like that's a game show in itself. <laughs> yeah, it's awesome. So, I mean, moving a house overnight is pretty darn fast, though. I mean, it's pretty impressive. Okay, excellent. Okay, so then I can show you some of the other components that, of, um, of how we keep them in the lab. Okay. So... Basically, what we'll do is once they've moved into the colony, like you can see here, they've all moved into this colony. We destroyed their old nest. They all moved in. So you have all of the workers, which are these individuals moving around. Get a little bit more in focus. We have the brood, which are these, the larvae, which is basically the offspring that they're taking care of. And then these larger, darker individuals are the queens. And there's two queens there. Exactly, yeah. So this species, like some other species of ant, can be polygynous, which means they have multiple queens inside one nest. Fascinating. Yeah. And so they're, ha they're happy or relatively happy in their house right now. Exactly. Well, not right now because I took the lid off. I oh, took okay. the, the red filter away, so to them it just got really bright. <laughs> uh, so they might think that their house is being destroyed, but we can put it back on and they'll realize that they're safe again. And you have other things in that Petri dish or in that dish with them, right? Exactly, yes. Yeah. So we give them a little dish uh, for food, so they need a sugar source and a protein source. So um, one really easy way to get them that is to get, feed them a sugar cube and some, ant, uh, some, uh, some cat food. Oh, delicious. Yeah, some, for protein. You can also give them frozen and thawed uh, cricket bits, which is pretty nice, because they're, they're scavengers. They don't hunt actively, so they just go out hmm. and get you know, detritus and pieces of, um, of biological materials to eat. So we can basically feed them any type of protein like that. And can you do experiments with them in the wild? 
It's possible, but it's much more difficult. Okay. Uh, so you'd imagine these ants are pretty small, and they yes. live oftentimes in uh, deciduous forests. So tracking individuals as they're going through the leaf litter is a pretty difficult thing to do. Although I know researchers that have done it, and it's very impressive. Wow. I do not do it. I bring them into the lab where it's much easier. <laughs> and how would you set up an experiment? So it depends on which question we're trying to address. Mm -hmm. If we're interested in individual level behaviors, like the behavior of an individual worker, what we'll often do is take them out of the colony and identify you know, characteristics of that, of that worker. So their behavioral traits, morphological traits, um, and then we can look at the things that they're doing. So like how they take care of the brood, how they go forage for food, um, how they would um, take, what their role would be in that nest site selection process. Um, that's sort of at the individual level. At the collective level, we would be studying the behavior of the entire colony. So things like, um, you know, how well do they take care of the brood as a, as a whole, or how long does it take the entire colony to move, move over into a new nest, or what are their grooming networks like? So like, as individuals are taking care of the brood or grooming each other, what does that sort of social network look like? Uh, and to do that, we often have to paint individual ants so we can track individuals inside the colony. Which and is, so the paintbrush is obviously quite small, I'm assuming. It is, it is. Yeah, it's very difficult. So you actually have to give them sometimes multiple paint dots because ants will be able to tell. If you just give them one paint dot on one ant and throw them into the colony, they can tell that something is different about it and they will clean off the paint. Oh, so it's really? one of the difficulties is if you paint the ants, they'll often clean the paint off. Oh. So yeah, so you have to paint everyone. So right. they think that that's just normal, that they all have paint on them. And you have to sometimes give them multiple dots because if one of them cleans off one, you can still tell who is who. Wow. Yeah. So you really focus on the ultimate explanations for behavior, which are like the evolutionary consequences, right? Exactly, yeah. So I'm really interested in questions about what, um, how do animal societies proliferate? How do they survive? How do they make new colonies? So it's really like fitness-based questions um, and, and looking at the relationship between different characteristics of colonies and how they can influence their survival and their reproductive output. And what is like a particular interest that you have with these, these ants? Like what are you working on right now? Yeah. Oh yeah, so I'm really interested in collective behaviors okay. and they have a lot of really cool collective behaviors. So uh, we study how they organize those behaviors, so which individuals do which tasks during the, this you know, cooperative collective behavior, but also how those collective traits are related to group survival, uh, especially with things like interactions with infectious diseases. And what have you found about infectious diseases? I'm assuming that if, if you live in a group and there's an infectious disease, that's not really a great thing to have. Yeah, it's sort of a really, uh, we often think about that as one of the cons of social living, is that um, although you're li all living together, you're getting lots of benefits, um, reduced predation risk, you get more food if you're in a group. Uh, but one of the problems is, is that you're at higher risk of infectious disease outbreaks. Uh, the one of the interesting things though is that in ants and other eusocial insects, we see uh, th this really interesting social immunity. So although you would think all these ants living together in a colony, the risk of, of outbreaks would be really high, but we actually don't see that very often because they have these really unique, interesting behaviors where they prevent outbreaks from occurring. So for example, if they see that an individual worker becomes infected, they'll kick them out of the colony so they can't come in. Um, they have different types of uh, uh, differ differentiation of tasks. So the individuals that are more likely to be out in the wild, potentially becoming infected with pathogens, aren't the ones that are, for example, working with the brood because that could increase the likelihood right. of, of transmission. Are there different types of interactions within the colony based on the type of pathogen that they have? Yeah, I think there is. So there's a lot of different types of parasites and pathogens that can infect a lots of different species of ants. Uh, so for example, I study generalist entomopathogenic uh, fungi. So these are uh, fungus that kill all sorts of insects. They have a really broad host range. But then there's also really highly co-evolved, very specific fungi that will attack only one species of ant, and they do so in this really uh, interesting, very specific ways. So for example, um, we often hear about Ophiocordyceps, uh, the, the, the fungus that t turns ants into zombies. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's this really, really interesting, highly co-evolved system uh, with one species of ant and one species of fungus. So uh, we see different types of interactions in a system like that as opposed to a sort of a generalist pathogen that I'm working on, they can, they can be infecting all sorts of animals, so it doesn't have a very, its life cycle isn't, you know, specific to this species of ant. And the fungus that you work on, is it dangerous to everyone, or is it just 
just ants? Uh, not just ants, but a lot of different species of insects. So it actually has, um, it can infect hundreds of different uh, species of insect, but it's not harmful at all to humans, so it's really nice to work with in the lab. That's good, and yeah. you keep it under a hood? We do, yeah. So we keep it under a, in a biosafety cabinet, which is not uh, because it's harmful to humans. It's basically protecting the cultures from us getting you know novel microbes in there. So it's it's more like we're protecting the experiment, we're not protecting us. Okay, that's yeah. well, that's fair. I yeah, mean, <laughs> exactly. And so when you use this fungus, what do you do? Do you just introduce like a couple spores to the colony, and or uh, what happens? Yeah, so there's a couple of different ways you can do it. You can um, put the spores directly onto individual workers. So it's like you're saying this worker went out into the into nature, became infected, but you did that experimentally, and then you want to see how do other workers in the colony interact with it. How does its behavior change? Or you can, um, you know, we can test how an individual's behavior influences its likelihood of becoming infected in the first place. So we'll put uh, spores in like a, 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 you know, natural levels that we would find out in nature somewhere uh, in the environment, so we're in, in a laboratory setting, and then release ants to go out and forage or do whatever they would naturally and see if they're more likely to, to be the ones to pick up uh, those pathogens. And then we can see how their, their behavioral interactions change. So you're really looking at you're taking these ultimate questions and applying something like a pathogen or some other, you're changing the dynamic and seeing what happens. Is that what you'd say? Exactly, yeah. So our sort of, um, our independent variable, you know, that we're, what we're manipulating is the presence or absence of pathogens and seeing how that alters not only individual and colony behaviors, but then also survival and uh, reproductive output, so sort of fitness consequences. Fascinating. So we just talked to Nick, who was saying that he really looks at the ultimate explanations for these behaviors. Would you say that you are more focused on the direct mechanisms or the proximate? Yes. Okay. Uh, I'm interested in how the um, genetic system, how the genes and the biological pathways uh, regulate your sociality, and basically how, how the genes turn on, turning on and off, basically uh, either alter the gene expression or maintain the gene expression and uh, then giving rise to the uh, different phenotypes in different castes. Okay, and what is what would you call uh, it when there are different phenotypes and that show based on uh, what goes on and like what genes turn on and off? Oh, basically we uh, that's uh, the phenotypic plasticity. Okay, and uh, it's uh, basically that uh, in the end how the genes turning on and off that basically in, re in response to the different environment. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's what we're interested in. And how, what kind of different environments will change what genes turn on and off? Oh, so uh, basically we talk about uh, phenotypic uh, differences in different castes, like uh, different uh, physiology, uh, behavior, morphology, and their lifespan. And uh, uh, these differential uh, phenotypes uh, basically response to the different environment uh, inside the colony and uh, during the development it's maybe regulated by their nutrition or by, that, by their temperature but also interesting for the ant species that's shown here in Hapinesos that's unique to some species including Hapinesos the phenotypic uh, uh, difference also change in their doubt so the workers has a chance to become a pseudocrine to lay eggs uh, to become reproductive uh, uh, in the certain environment when the environment change. So this is a worker? Yes, this is a worker. And a pseudo queen would look like a worker? The pseudo queen morpholo morphologically is exactly the same as a worker. And what does an actual queen look like? So actual queen is a little bit or slightly bigger than the worker. And also the queen has a wings. So when they uh, grow, when they emerge, it has a wing so it can fly out and then mate. After they mate, they come to the ground and uh, dig a nest, shed off the wing, and uh, found the whole colony. Wow, okay. And so you said that they can change based on the environment within the colony. So you're talking about like, so if the queen dies, then that's when you would get a sweet queen? Yes. Queen? Basically, uh, in the nature, when the queen dies and the worker basically undergo this uh, uh, a tenor uh, a, attack to each other, and uh, basically they uh, we call it dueling. During this dueling, the ones that frequent do will become reproductive. So we call the uh, pseudocrine or gamergates. 
Morphologically, they don't. They are very similar, and but uh, they show behavior difference. They show uh, they are reproductive, and uh, they are five times longer uh, lifespan than the workers. So basically, physiologically and uh, behaviorally, and uh, uh, they show some changes, but they don't show morphological change. Really interesting. And you also mentioned as well that it could be like the environment, like temperature as well. So do you think climate change would have an effect on how this, this phenotypic plasticity would work? Uh, yes, I think so. Uh, because uh, the uh, climate change may change the environment or may change their uh, you know, food sources and uh, also may change the temperature when they grow, when they develop and also may change the whole environment uh, that they, uh, they live. So that may uh, have the effect on the uh, ant colonies. So do the queens live as long? Do they live five times longer than the uh, workers do? So normally the queen can live up to 10 times longer than workers in many ant species. Uh, this is amazing that the queen and worker basically differentiation occur at the developmental stage, basically larval stage, and depending on what I said, the nutrition, temperature, and other environmental factors. But for this end, basically the pseudo queen starts from the worker. So when the environment change, for example, you remove the queen or you uh, the queen dies, there's no queen pheromone there. So they undergo this fighting and become a pseudo queen and show queen like behavior and the reproduction and the physiology, and they can live five times longer uh, than the workers. Although they are not live longer, uh, live as long as queen, but they can also live much longer than the workers. So, why doesn't every worker just turn into a pseudo queen if they're going to live five times longer? Uh, that's a very good question. <laughs> So normally in a mature colony, uh, the queen can generate the queen pheromone and which can suppress the worker reproduction. So suppress the regular worker to convert to the pseudo queen. And interestingly, the queen pheromone is already identified a long chain cuticular hydrocarbon. So essentially the queen has suppressed everyone else from turning into pseudo queen. And then when there is no queen, then pseudo queen or potential pseudo queens essentially fight to see who becomes that the new. Yes, and uh, basically that can the the uh, mechanism to maintain the uh, stability of the colony when the queen's there. Normally, not all the workers won't become reproductive, right. so there's a suppressive mechanism. But when the queen uh, dies in this species, they want to maintain the colony survival. So that's the way that they basically do not have the reproductive uh, cost, but they can generate new reproductive costs. So the, the, the colony can live longer. Okay. Does the pseudo queen also release pheromones when it's been decided who it's going to be? Oh, that's another good question. <laughs> yes. So basically, I said the queen, the pseudo queen, display queen-like behavior, mm -hmm. uh, uh, physiology, and they live longer. And interestingly, they can also generate the queen pheromone exactly same as the real queen and suppress the worker reproduction and uh, establish or maintain the mature colony. So that that's really. Interesting. So they have essentially make the switch to a queen, except for the fact that they're not, they don't look like the queen original or would. Yes. So that's why we call it pseudo queen. They are not real queen, and uh, they basically take over the queen role to stabilize the colony. And all of this, all the switching back from one cast to another, that's all epigenetics. That's looking at epigenetics. Because they are also, as I said, they are nearly genetically identical, but all this switch from the worker to pseudo queen is basically their phenotypic change, but that's not related to their uh, genotypes. They are regulated by the turning on and off of the genes and also maintaining this gene expression when they already started their new role in the colony become pseudo queen. Great, and that's proximate explanations, such as direct mechanism. Yes, that's Fascinating. true. Fascinating. Interesting. Ants are incredible animals to study. They are eusocial animals, which means they live, work, and breed almost like a super organism. 
In many fields, scientists can work collaboratively to find answers to evolutionary mysteries. As Dr. Yan looks at the striking plasticity of ants and how the environment affects it, Dr. Kaiser can investigate the evolutionary consequences and vice versa.